I'm going to uh, kick off the next, uh, the first session, and I'm going to invite um, Aline Braden and Lauren Moulds and Scott Renton, um, and we're going to have a bit of discussion around making the undiscoverable discoverable. Lauren uh, joins us from the University of Virginia Law Library and um, is an archivist but has a, a digital um, responsibility to his role. Aline is our cataloguing archivist at the University of Edinburgh and Scott Renson is, works in the library digital development team for um, the University of Edinburgh and um, has been involved in, in all manner of uh, cataloguing systems and um, platforms that we use um, across the, the library and museums teams. So, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to uh, have a, a dedicated session on cataloguing and on metadata and the challenges uh, that we face. And I thought we'd pick on Lauren first, really. Um, so yeah, get ready, Lauren. Um, can I just say, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat um, and then I can pick them up um, from there and we can make sure that we can ask the right questions to the right uh, people or, or explore particular themes that you're interested in. So Lauren, I wanted to pick up on some of the things that we talked about over the past few days. Um, and uh, you, you have described how you've taken the data that was output from the editor tool and then you've pulled it into systems at UVA and then made it more discoverable. I was wondering about any challenges around that because we're thinking about how do we use, for example, our cataloging system archive space and push things out to make them prettier, to make them more engaging, to package them up for researchers. Um, so, well, let's make sure that I'm not um, claiming more success than we've actually made. Um, I think actually, so because our two respective projects, the Edinburgh project and the, the Virginia project started relatively at the same time, but for a substantial amount of time unaware of each other, we had a very slightly different, but well, we had a different approach in which we were looking to very richly describe our documents to see, to confirm that they were extremely valuable pieces of historical uh archival documents right so what we did is we created a we working starting with dublin core starting with the uh, frameworks that already existed for describing session papers we expanded well beyond that and trying to include uh agent records uh geographic locations subject themes taxonomies that were not sort of standard that we knew fit really really well with both historical and our sort of our own intellectual framework for describing these papers. So that being said, we then the next phase, as we call it, was using full text indexing from the Luna, from the editor tool, as we would call it now. And then what were the next phase, once the editor tool comes into a, uh, let's call it a, 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 a mature release, and we know what the data looks like, and it has some sort of you know, API, we want to be able to then take the data that editor takes and then integrate it in with our, our metadata. And that's the, so we got excited about crosswalking metadata. So we haven't done that yet, but we have every expectation that that is really the way to go. Um, because from what we're seeing, um, the, the tool that, that the, the, the the data that editors creating maps very, very well to what we've already created. And I think a lot of it is because that our groups were working together to create that metadata scheme collectively. And so really it's just a matter of taking one framework and mapping it onto another one. But we do think that the work that we used to do that was so painstaking is now very, very straightforward comparatively and much faster and will map well to what we've done already. That's, a, you've, we've started off on a good note because it really, really, um, one of my, um, 
favourite things about cataloguing and being an archivist is, and Scott will know this from past work we've done, is doing that metadata crosswalking and getting systems talking to each other um, from a, an archival perspective and use of the standards in the most flexible way, but right. also, um, you know, um, being able to do it in the technical way and bringing the languages together. So Scott, I wonder if you want to jump in here and talk about things that we, we've done in the past, but also the challenges around tricky content and trying to get these things to fit. <coughs> yeah, well, we've got um, sort of all manner of things, really. Uh, our collections ed uh, platform for, uh, for, for collections viewing is uh, is expressed in Dublin Core, but it's pulling content from um, the various systems. Uh, we we use uh, uh, Vernon CMS, which uh, is uh, a museum's collections management system, um, and this ex expresses its content in, in Spectrum uh, Spectrum VRA. We also have Archive Space, which uh, which expresses content in, in EAD and the ISID G standard. Uh, and we have um, our rare books, which are, we're pulling in as well, which is coming through from Mark. And what we're trying to do, I think, and what we have tried to do in the past in Collections Ed is we, we use uh, DSpace as the uh, sort of underlying repository for for that, with um, you know some some uh, a web framework on top of it. And what we have had to do is really sort of shoehorn all these different kinds of data into into Dublin Core along the way. And, and you, you know, you can imagine um, some of the challenges that we've had with that. It, it has made for for very extended Dublin Core, which uh, which which you know perhaps uh, is um, you know it 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 will work for certain needs. But we we have to think beyond that and think think how it works uh, for for everybody, because we know that. If somebody comes along and wants to OAI harvest, or uh, if, if that's a concept that you're all familiar with, uh, uh, coming along and, and grabbing our data from from our repository, what we'll find is that if we've extended that that data too far, it loses the commonality and it loses the uh, the the interoperability in in some ways. So you you know all your data might be there, but it might be expressed in a way that's um, that's difficult to really understand. Um, we, I think well, probably one of the best projects I think where we've um, exercised a lot of crosswalking would be the uh, the MIMO project. Now MIMO was um, a, an international aggregator of mu musical instruments museums, which uh, a colleague Norman, who I'm sure you're very familiar with over the last few days, uh, led from from Edinburgh. Uh, I I looked after the Edinburgh's contribution to that, and what we were doing was. Um, in order to get the the content into its final home, we were starting off with uh, with Vernon, so it was expressed originally in, in Spectrum VRA. It then moved into Dublin Core when it went into DSpace. It then got crosswalked into Lido so that uh, it could go to Mimo, and then after it had left Mimo to go to Europeana, it moved into Europeana data model. So you can you can understand you know some of the uh, challenges of keeping everything uh, consistent and meaningful when it's gone through effectively five. Uh, levels on, on the way through, uh, so so yeah, lot, lots of challenges. I think um, as far as the the editor stuff is concerned, uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm almost um, having having sort of worked on the the Luna template, Luna being the uh, digital as, as, asset management system that we use. Uh, I mean that that template started off uh, in VRA, but as you know, it's it's been molded and changed uh, a little bit over the way. So I'm almost grateful that there was so little metadata in the in the session papers that you couldn't really go too far wrong with it. You know, it was quite obvious where where the, the small amounts of data you had to, to put would end up, and there would be very little ambiguity. At, it's, at the it's yeah, it's it's great that um, I mean that that's what's great about the the session papers, the formulaic. They're of a type, and so you know, and the way things have been structured, it is very you know, it's a formulaic documentation, so you can pull similar data uh, through. And um, before I move on to the question, I want to ask Aline uh, about that. Um, Kyle Roberts has asked, um, "Will you be able to automate what you, you you talked about, Lauren? And will there be or will there have to be human checking?" It's it's a fantastic question, and I think one that we've we've theorized how that workflow will go. Um, as you saw last night with the editor tool, or we've seen through the um, the workshop, 
that the editor tool itself is one that's based on human correction as what well, so it's teaching the model to be better um i don't think that we're going to just implicitly trust the data that we get on mass because our collection is something that we can manage um because it's you know uh, 10,000 pages and we don't have to look at those um the, the cover sheet's the most important one on the first page i think what we would likely do is as we created the the document shell with the digitized images and sent that over to luna um and then and it went through whatever that post-processing was, what we would call editor, and then the data was ready for harvest back at UVA, we would probably just flag it as something that needed to be vetted one last time to verify, you know, that this stuff was coming over correctly. I think one of the biggest questions we have about automation, and I don't know if we've even discussed this as at a wider collective project, is this ambiguation of the entities and geographic locations um, because uh, quite simply there's a lot of people who share names there's a lot of people who don't have completed names there's ambiguous references to locations so i, I know that there exists lots of projects that i'm thinking of snack in particular and there's gazetteers and all that sort of stuff that could help us be more accurate but one of the things that for our data is we are have always been at pains to avoid ambiguation in in agents and records uh, for uh, ge uh, geographic records. So that hasn't been discussed. We don't have a workflow, but it is definitely something that needs to be addressed. And I think will make this tool even more powerful. And it's not something that I think we can't do. We just haven't done it because, I mean, we just saw that it could do it within the last few months. So I guess I, to answer the automation question, no, I don't think it'll come um, unvetted on on mass to our site. Um, but I don't really suspect that that's a too onerous of a task because once the tool becomes really good, we can trust it pretty, we can trust it, I think, to some extent, and then just make sure the data is coming over looks good, and then we send it off. I mean, there'll just be a flag step there, and if we have to make changes, uh, we'll have to figure out what the reciprocity between our end and, rep and editor will be, um, but all of it is, I think, pretty manageable. Yeah, I mean that 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 you brought up something really important there actually about um uh, authorities and agents and um geographic data. And I know we've done projects um before, um, so the Carmichael Watson project, which we had on a platform and we had to kind of bring into archive space, um, did originally have that geolocation um gazetteer approach so that we we could um accurately because the, the the Gallic place names had changed over time so we needed to pinpoint on a map where the, where were they talking about um but it's not always it's not a quite a straightforward thing that idea of um language and description and uh, so I was going to bring a, a lean in at this point because um, as cataloging archivist for us you've worked on a number of projects where you've had to think about these things it's not always straightforward so it's not like the session papers where there's a structure to the actual documentation or even to the the archive collection and you've had to think about well who's involved what is this in the first place so that beautiful messy archival stuff that's going on um you know it'd be interesting to think about how these tools could help with this or you know actually demonstrate which is what we've been talking about all along um which is um you need the tools because they help make things better and faster, but you also need the human being. So Aline, do you want to comment on what your experience is? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I hope I'm not going to get disconnected again. Uh, I had a little uh, internet beep. So if I disappear, my internet has done that, but hopefully not. Um, yeah, absolutely, Rachel. So um, I'm a cataloging archivist, but um, I, I'm not able to go as deep as I would want, uh, obviously, because as an archivist, you know, you, your goal is to put things out there. So for us on archive space, for example, um, so it, it's published, but sometimes obviously I wouldn't have the time to delve very deep into a collection, which has like hundreds of volumes with like hundreds of, of pages and everything. So I have to rely on, um, a lot of external information, all the hand lists, and we know, you know, they're not, they're really good, but um, sometimes they're a bit out of date, or, and also like information from 
uh, book selling catalog. So things like that. So having some things that would allow us to actually have a, a look into the contents really of something um, would would really help, I think, for us for, as archivists to to know really to have this close look into um, a collection without having to spend you know hours and days and days that we don't have. Unfortunately, it would be great if we had, but. Um, so you could have a look at, I can see a lot of ways it could be helpful for us to catalog, um, catalog, catalog it. So for example, um, to know uh, the important content, to see what words come back again and again. Um, and to see, and Rachel, we were talking about that, to see what kind of language is used. Um, so for us to be able to, to context, uh, contextualize it. So um, to, to really, put everything in contact because this is the job of the archivist. And I think this is something that um, tools like this can't do, or they can't do it. So, you know, this kind of tool can give you a perfect transcription word per word, but they're not being able to really understand it. Like they're, they're gonna see a word, um, which at the time was, you know, okay, and was become really outdated or, um, so the job of the archivist, I think, um, is to contextualize it. So obviously, that's why it's a, it's a tool, and it's not going to to replace uh, the archivist. And you also have to be aware that even if it's um, uh, AI, it's not it's not neutral. It's just gonna show you what is inside. But you you have to actually do the work um, and help the user understand it. Absolutely. I mean, thank you, Deborah from the Folger Shakespeare Library for putting in the, the uh, social networks and archival content, uh, context link, because that fits quite nicely with what we're, we're talking about and that Lauren had mentioned it. And that idea of context and language and, and description is really important. I mean, um, if you um, consider um, people who've written about algorithms and, and various things and how things that are built are only as good as you know the bias that the people who build them have and we know we've seen in various things google has bias and they, they happen to continually uh, correct that and a former colleague of ours has, has gone to work on a another very um well-known uh, social media giants um in terms of taxonomies to try and correct theirs you know so our work as archivists is valued in a wider context but also you know if we bring it back to this idea of language um sometimes i get i i think that our um our catalogue structures and our standards can straitjacket us in terms of that language um and i know there's been much debate about do standards actually perpetuate issues around description um but we've got a you know an ethical responsibility to consider that and to um think about how do we structure our, our our descriptions our data about collections i wonder if you you want to come in here um lauren because we've you know aline and and yourself and i had a bit of a chat about this the other day didn't we about how that that responsibility of getting our collections data into a, a sense where it's um it's understood or it's not as biased or biased as as it has been before yeah and I, I i don't want to claim that i know how to do it right i just want to you know i think one of the things that is is important to recognize that when you approach organizing data about historical subjects or when we have to impose a, a, a way of describing the way we choose to describe someone or an historical period we just have to be constantly mindful that we're in, inherently biased in doing that. And I, 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 again, I'll say, it, I don't, I try to be mindful of it. I'm always trying to do better, but again, we have to listen to the people who are experts, listen to the people who um, use uh, these collections all the time and to, 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 to constantly make sure that we're doing as best we can. And I, I think the other thing that, I wanted to say, and I think it's slightly off topic, but one of the things that excited me the most about the session papers was it's a collection that has historically been very difficult to access. 
and one that's been used by a very privileged subset of academia simply because the way it's organized, the way it's collected is arcane and uh, it's a civil court. So it's not really based on precedent as much as being have to read these individualized cases to know what's going on. But I would say that like, that we have two things that we can do that's really exciting. First of all, of course, as archivists would say, we have a responsibility for respect des fonds to, to preserve the original order and you know how these files were submitted to the court, uh, and how they were collected by their respective owners. But on the other hand, and I think this is actually my point here, is the digital component of this. And I think Mike's point as well about how it's really important to think about, it's just cool that we can get stuff out en masse. But I'll say that the session papers have become a much more democratic and much more comprehensive window into the past because we've opened it up. And we have to understand that the tools we've created, yes, are going to impose some problems, but we can correct them. What's so exciting about the session papers is they tell entire histories that have been locked up in archives about individual people, about individuals' lives and how they negotiated their time and um, each other. So I think um, that's what's so cool about the digital technology as well, is, is, is we're mindful of doing it as best we can and our, our biases, about uh, imposing uh, descriptions on these things. It also makes them available to people that doesn't have us as an intermediary. I, I, that really excites me as well. It makes me think of the, you know, us as activist archivists. So it's using these tools to, yeah, as you said, quite rightly, preserve as we should, you know, preserve original orders, provenance um, and context, but then blow it wide open in, in a sense to um, allow more democratic access um, to explain that context and not, not get rid of it, but explain it and allow people to see what they want to be able to get out of these uh, collections. Um, I know um, that Dean is very aware of discussions we've been having in, in the archives team at the University of Edinburgh about how we use language and how we, we do that thing. But uh, I was wondering, Alina, if you can see the potential for particular collections you've tackled where you could use technologies like Transcribers or something to actually get into the nitty gritty and then make them more democratically available. Um. <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm trying to find a good example in our um, in our archives. Um, I was wondering about some of the we haven't tackled, like we've got uh, the papers of uh, um, of Legum, who is a um, you know a, a journalist in South Africa, and actually, if we were to use some of these tools on the printed and the written in that collection, then it would be throwing out that much more detail that would allow people's voices to be heard that when if we were just saying newspaper cutting 1953, mm -hmm. Legum's notes on this 1954. Yes, so yeah, Legum is a good example because we've got, I think that's 800, 800 boxes um, that we uh, we got like several, several years ago, but with collection of this size, it's obviously, really hard uh, to find the resources. It's hard like to find the resources, it's harder. Um, so myself and, and my colleague Lorraine, uh, the appraisal archivist, we actually decided to start a collection review and just went box by box looking into them. And then we realized how rich it was. And a lot of it was uh, newspaper cuttings um, from African countries, so post-colonial, uh, in the post-colonial era and during this, you know, this transition um, so it was actually really, really rich. Um, so I think I think you're right, um, Rachel, that this is a kind of collection where you could have just like an idea of, of the richness it contains, but it's also the kind of collection where you absolutely need, you know, a, an archivist and an expert, someone who is an expert uh, in the subject to contextualize everything. Some of the material is really hard to, to see or hard to read and and obviously, as an archivist, you can't uh, be an expert on everything. Um, so you have to, to work with other people and then uh, produce something which 
allows people to look into you know a collection and see the richness of it you don't want to close it because you're afraid that you know it's going to be taken and um not used in a good way but you also yeah you also want to to really um make sure it's contextualized i, I use this word a lot but i feel like it's like it's the key it's good i feel like that's what all these tools which are really good can't do so that i think that's when the human actually have to intervene and i also think no archival description is neutral and i'm, I'm sure um rachel so no human is neutral like no archivist can produce a neutral description but i don't even think um you know tools like editor tools like ai are neutral either because they're created by uh, humans so you need to have this kind of awareness of who you are and the context in which you operate and what your tools are and with all this knowledge you know you produce something um obviously you know you won't produce something perfectly neutral or perfectly like enlightened i don't know an enlightened description but yeah all you can do is be aware and and, and do your best and be have done your research absolutely and you, your point brings me back towards uh, Scott and um, uh, being a uh, human being that creates systems and uh, d d does that development work. Um, and uh, I'm sure you're not as flawed as some of us, but you will have your, your biases. And I was wondering when you, you do your work, what you have to think of, or, and, and we're aware of, um, you know, for example, platforms being built um, in a bespoke way, and I'm sure everyone's had experience of that, and then them either falling over or becoming old and obsolete, because not just because of the the um, you know technical language, but also how the technical stuff represents it as well. So I was wondering what your view is on that that kind of bias and how that plays into development work. Yeah, um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure if intrinsically. Uh, <clears throat> pushing bias in as such, but uh, it, it it makes me think of our, our early uh, experiments with, with crowdsourcing and, and that sort of thing. We, we, we uh, set up a, a method of games platform, which uh, was intended to sort of improve the searchability of the uh, the data that we, we have in Luna. And uh, we, we found that, you know, we, we did drives where we got uh, 30 or 40 people into a room at a time and, and just basically made them describe what was what was in a, in a in an image and i think what, what we found was we, we we got an awful lot out of that in terms of data but we didn't know how much of it was necessarily usable i mean we tried to you know do certain things around thresholds of agreement and uh, corroboration and that sort of thing to push things in but what 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 we did find actually after after a while was that um the it was almost the lack of automation that we had around the the pushing the stuff back into the into the system that uh, that, that that meant that, that that we we start to sort of fall behind and, and and slip off there. I think that uh, one of the one of the things that we had to make sure about though was that we 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 did uh, impose a sort of two tier thing to the the metadata that came through so that we made it obvious that anything that had, had come from one of these drives was uh, was was given to us by humans and, and not uh, uh, or, or or by lay people who were not um you know collection specialists and and, and the while it may help help to find things easier in the in the system it, it didn't necessarily in, in improve the veracity of the data and we we had to be quite clear about that uh, and I know that this is this is a problem that comes up when you when you crowdsource um, in in any context. Absolutely, I know we did some some work on sort of different forms of trying to crowdsource, particularly around language, a number of years ago, and that was it gets you to to a certain point. I think crowdsourcing works when there's a formulaic, but the the kind of knotty. Um, difficult archival collections of variety of formats and uh, scripts and languages and that, you know, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to um, to crowdsourcing. It doesn't also, uh, at times, but it doesn't also lend itself to um, tools like Transcribus because you can't build a model on them. 
So I'm wondering, you know, let's take this conversation that step forward and, and think about the technology and the people coming together. Where do we go next on that, those difficult collections that aren't formulaic, that aren't um, uh, tidy, that are messy and reflect, you know, human beings often? Um, it would be interesting to see what we can do to, to push forward these tools for cataloging, for um, description or for um, uh, transcription. Uh, and how, how can we push them down that particular road, which it can't necessarily do at the moment? Lauren, do you want to have a comment on that? And can I ask everyone, do, do put questions in so I can ask our panel uh, any questions you have on your, your thoughts on cataloguing um, and the things we've been discussing. Lauren, um, can you think of collections that you've dealt with which are um, knotty, not formulaic, not same material that are a bit um, messy because they're from a human, for example? Well, <laughs> I think the, the biggest challenge that we have, um, at least from the law school's perspective, is there's the, I, I can think of two collections in particular. One, um, I mentioned, uh, so we had two or three boxes that were just jammed, jammed packed with negatives from the student newspaper um, and from about the late 60s on, through the 90s, all black and white for the most part. And we had a student digitize them, all the negatives. It was 40,000 images. And, you know, this we probably accomplished maybe six years ago. And we tried to run it through, you know, some platforms that could do, you know, AI to sort of figure it out. And this was early, early on. It was Amazon technology. It was clearly had been developed in India because all of the base the softball is a big thing at law schools in the US. And all of the softball came in as cricket. So, I mean, and then there was all sorts of issues that we had with using AI for it. And so then we said, well, we'll set up a system where we can have the people who have been at the law school for 30 years, employees, just when they have an opportunity, go through and do it. And it was valuable, but it was just so hard to get really reliable information because they only want to do a few and they get bored with it then or they do it differently than the person who did it before and so then you have just this whole mess it's not mess is an affair it's just it's just that's how humans are going to do it if you just send up uh, over the an iterative process of 10 different people doing it 10 different ways and picking the things that they're interested in so that was one that's like we haven't figured out the right way to do it yet beyond simply just having one person hired to do it until it's completed and then i think the other one that we had that, and maybe this doesn't answer your question and I'll, I'll, I'll finish this really quickly. Um, one of the things that we, we've, we have a, a really large flagship collection um, about the, the war crimes in the Pacific. And um, we were donated because of the initial project that was online. We were donated by a family, um, uh, about eight very dense binders of depositions uh, based on uh, war, these war crimes. And they were horribly graphic. And they were really, really, really difficult to get through, often quite, quite bad. And so we have yet to figure out exactly how we want to take something that's so painful to read and actually quite traumatic to read just as archivists. But we understand that it is consequential historical information, but making it accessible. And obviously, this was we weren't able to really get to it because we'd finally digitized it and finally described it right about this time last year so the pandemic has really thrown a wrench into how we want to move forward with that but we do want to reach out to our colleagues at, at other institutions particularly the, the national holocaust museum in, in dc to say how do we approach this material and how do we present it online how do we prevent people from being unexpectedly traumatized by seeing something that's just available on the internet how do we contextualize that trauma? How do we make these available for the important documents they are? So those are the sort of things that I can think of, um, uh, two collections that have imposed sort of problems to just sort of taking it and making it available. That, that's a, you know, you bring up a really good point and it's, you know, it is on point as well um, because um, I can think of collections we've got that we've not 
dealt with at the University of Edinburgh and we have talked within um, the archives team about resilience and the impact on the archivist as much as on the user when having to deal with those um, those those things. I think we could have a whole session on talking about the ethics, data protection and resilience um, as well. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, first, I'm going to um, sort of ping this back to Aline. And uh, would you say that the pandemic and requirement to work from home away from the collections has changed your approach to metadata creation? Uh, I, I think we realize like there is a lot of things we can do from home, but also a lot of stuff we can't do from home. So. Um, we've been, I've been working with, um, with a member of the team to convert old hand lists, for example, into actual proper archive space resources. So uh, to make it more searchable, etc. But we have to rely on, on them. And sometimes they've been created, you know, 40 years ago or something. So there's still a lot of things you can do. But also you can't, you know, just go to the collection and check something. Uh, you can. So I think you have to rely on all the on machines, on all the uh, finding aids. So it adds more layer between the original document and you. And I think this is more risky because the more layers between the cataloger and the, and the document and between the user and the document, the more risk for uh, mistakes or misinterpretations there are. So working from home, I think, yeah, you can still do a lot, but you also have to be careful. And actually the original documents are absolutely uh, vital and even when they've been digitized sometimes they haven't been digitized entirely or sometimes you want to check you know something some a lot of things you can't actually see from a picture sometimes you know like very faint uh, writing or you know things that have been erased or like the paper the paper looks different or things like that I don't know so yeah I think I think for me it emphasizes the fact that original documents can't be replaced. You know, you can't just, I don't think as an archivist, you can do the entirety of your work from home. That's a, a brilliant answer to, to that one, I think. Thank you, Elaine. And we're going to end, I'm conscious of time, we're going to uh, finish with a, a final question from Elaine, which is on how can we be better at ante anticipating how our collections might be used by researchers, or how do we raise awareness uh, of potential research activity um, and do you think that that will come as big data sets are, are opened up more and more can we anticipate how people use things from a you know either a cataloging perspective or from a technical perspective and i'm going to open it up to all three of you i would just like to mention that um <clears throat> we, we you know we've spent uh, the last several years sort of getting our stuff online and in a lot of cases for the first time uh, you know that we things like our art collection and music concerts collection and archives weren't really available on the web until a few years ago uh, and that's that was sort of phase one uh, but but phase two i think is uh, is is sort of making that that data things that people can actually work with and play with and and you know uh, drill further into and what one of the the projects that's that's been driven towards that is the collections is data project which uh the the digital library have been working on it's been one of uh mike's sidelines when he's when he's not been doing a uh, editor uh, and we we've uh, started to make uh, the the university thesis collection av available uh i think it's about twenty five thousand theses uh, there and uh the Scottish statistical accounts and, and a few other things uh, to come, and I think uh, it's it's really about um, getting the stuff out there and and, and giving uh, researchers the opportunity to start you know investigating and doing things like text mining and data carpentry and uh, but you know digital scholarship and that sort of thing. I, I mean it's 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 new new for us as well. I think in a lot of ways, but uh, it's it's uh, it's definitely something that we are investigating a lot more and, and getting more knowledgeable. Yeah. It's, um, it is, I think we'll be surprised as more and more opens up. Um, but uh, Lauren and Aline, do you want to respond to that? I don't know if I have a good answer. What I'll say is I think, um, I think it's a great question. Um, and it's one that in terms of Randy and Jim and I and our whole team at UVA, where we're trying to, we, we, we 
had discussed, the session papers were ones that we decided, how can we integrate this in with the larger academic world? Like that was the, the chief driving question was how can we make these value? And it, what we did to do that was we surveyed faculty that we knew, we had subject experts who were actually on the team. Um, we tried to go to conferences, we gauged people's interests, we saw what they were asking about these sort of things, make it very, but that isn't really an approach that is universally available to archive, archivists for every collection. So uh, I don't know if I have the answer to that. I know that we found one collection that we knew deserved it, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other wonderful collections in ours and, and well, throughout the world that require work. I don't know if I have the right answer. I mean, the, the thing is, is just do the metadata right and do the description in a way that's honest and, and rich and uh, anticipates. And I know, I know the she's in the question the, is, how do we anticipate? I don't know. We just think, what, what would I do with this? <laughs> I don't know. As an historian, I think I can say, this is really cool and get super excited about something. So I didn't really give a good answer, but uh, I think that's how that's today. It was a great, it was a very honest human <laughs> answer. Um, Aline, do you want to finally give a final couple of words? Yeah, no, I, I think I, I think we can't, as archivists, anticipating all the ways researchers are going to use the collection, because I want to say it's research that researchers' job to actually find new ways, you know, to find, to find, um, well, yeah, to find new ways to research something, to use a collection. So we can, yeah, we can anticipate by talking, you know, to to researcher to the community. Uh, we can base ourselves our own, you know, experience. But yeah, I don't think we could anticipate everything because there's always, you know, someone that's going to surprise us. For example, people looking at, you know, the genetic material of, of charters or something. <laughs> so yeah, I would say this is almost like research researchers job actually to find new ways yeah. to look into things well that, that's a, a good um final point and uh, uh end to the session thank you everybody for your uh questions uh, and thank you to the panel thank you aline and lauren and scott for being part of this we're now going to have a 15 minute break which you can go into the slack channel and uh, talk to um, your colleagues there. Uh, and then the next session will be started and, and hosted uh, by Jim Ambuski uh, when we come back at just around four o'clock. Um, Aline will put the, uh, Elise rather, will put the countdown on the screen. So thank you very much to everybody for this session.